City Center Radio. It is episode 243, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Back from Phoenix and my alma mater, national champions, back to back, sixth time in their history. Yes, I've been enjoying uh, the post Phoenix trip. Uh, Such a great time. I won't dwell on it and bore you with all the details. I'm sure most of you do not care, Uh, but I I did have a fantastic time. Uh, Obviously, being there, seeing my school win the national championship in person was pretty incredible. Uh, Just an awesome experience overall being in the Phoenix, Tempe, Glendale area uh, was was just so much fun and uh, had a had a blast. I will say, um, in addition to the games, um, I also was able to try a couple fast food restaurants that I've heard about but I've never gotten to before. That includes In-N-Out Burger. I was stoked to finally have uh, a taste of this famous West Coast fast food franchise, and it was uh, just as tasty as advertised. I also made it to Del Taco, uh, which is a you know like a Mexican fast food restaurant. You know, think Taco Bell, but uh, actually better. <laughs> I mean, I only had a couple items, but uh, the quality of ingredients seemed a little better, and it was way more tasty than it had any business being. So I was quite happy with that. And I also went to the Phoenix Zoo one day. I, I like zoos and aquariums and museums and, and things like that. So uh, that was fun as well, just seeing all the different animals. It was a, a really uh, good park. You know, it seemed like the employees took real good care of it, kept it clean. Uh, and it was designed really well so that you could see a lot of animals. It was really great. But, you know, not too much else uh, to report on the trip that you all would be interested in. I will share one quick story, though. So, uh, I think I mentioned the last podcast, I, you know, there was some delays with the rental car. I wasn't able to go straight to my hotel before the final four started. So I didn't get back there until it was dark out. And, uh, the area I was in, you know, had some lights, but you couldn't really see all the businesses as I was driving down the the stretch, getting to my hotel, you know, because they were closed for the evening. But I was wondering if, oh, I wonder if there's any coffee around me. I saw a Starbucks. It was like, I don't know, a mile or so away from my hotel. And then I saw what I thought was either a local or like a West Coast franchise called Bikini Beans Coffee. Literally right across the street from my hotel. I thought, perfect. I'd rather, you know, go to some, even if it's a like regional chain, I'd rather go there than a national chain that I've been to a bunch of times. I'll go there tomorrow. So the next day I get in line. It's like one of those drive through walk up places and uh, had a decent amount of cars in line considering the time of day. You know, I wasn't there before 9 a.m. when people are, you know, maybe getting ready, getting coffee before work or whatever. So I was kind of surprised, but all right, whatever. Maybe it's just a good coffee place. So long story short, as I get around the corner and finally like enter the main uh, part of the drive through, I noticed that all of the employees are young women in bikinis. And all of a sudden, the name Bikini Beans Coffee made a lot more sense to me considering there's no water (laughs) or beaches around Phoenix. And uh, so needless to say, it was a little embarrassing. So I was like, oh, no, I had no idea this was it. Of course, as I look at the cars in line, it's all individual guys all by themselves. Uh, So yeah, certainly wasn't what I was expecting when I pulled into the uh, drive through. But uh, the coffee was actually pretty darn good. I assumed it was going to be terrible. I thought this was some shtick, you know, and this is how they bring people in. I mean, it is and it does. But I, yeah, I assumed it was in lieu of, you know, good coffee, but it was actually pretty good. So I was happy with my purchase and uh, it wasn't too embarrassing uh, considering I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So that was one kind of silly story about my trip there. Uh, But enough about that. Let's bring it back to Charleston and talk about the latest news. A big story that's happened over the last few weeks uh, involves a shooting that happened in Somerville in front of a Chick-fil-A where an off-duty officer shot and killed uh, a civilian. And at first reports made it seem like maybe the civilian was to blame. But then as video from witnesses came out, we realized, uh, no, it kind of looks like the police officer may have been the aggressive aggressor here. Uh, and so as more and more details came out, it, it 
certainly seems in law enforcement's mind that, yes, this officer was in the wrong. So if you need a little bit of a catch up, there was an off duty Somerville police officer who shot and killed a man during an altercation in a Chick-fil-A parking lot in March. He has now been charged with murder, according to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED. They investigate when there are police involved shootings, um, you know, instead of having the actual police department come in and you know do the investigation this outside entity is supposed to prevent any kind of like bias and things like that and they looked at video and and talked to people um and the the off-duty officer and they decided he needed to be charged with murder sled notified the somerville police department of those charges against anthony delustro uh on april 10th and then at, shortly after they let them know that these charges were coming, the murder charge was officially filed the same day. So again, that was on April 10th. He was uh, arrested, charged, put in jail, and was denied bond on that same day. So he remains in jail at this time. Now, according to SLED, Delustro shot and killed 39-year-old Michael P. O'Neill, who is originally from North Carolina, the altercation between the two occurred on March 20th in the parking lot of the Chick-fil-A at 1312 North Main Street. Eyewitnesses described Delustro as the primary aggressor. And then again, some video from bystanders came out and it certainly appeared that was the case on that as well. So uh, to just kind of briefly explain what happened, w w so far I haven't seen the exact nature of why they started this altercation. Um, but somehow they started arguing got out of their cars. Uh, Delustro, who's the off-duty officer, uh, by the way, he has since been fired, uh, so he is no longer um, with the Somerville Police Department, but he told O'Neill that he was under arrest and displayed his Somerville Police Department credentials. Uh, Delustro's handgun actually fell from its holster onto the pavement around this time, according to bystanders, so not doing a great job of securing that gun. Um, when he mentioned that O'Neill was under arrest, O'Neill decided he wanted nothing to do with this altercation uh, and went to his car to try to leave. However, as he was doing that, Delustro threatened to shoot him if he left. In addition to that, Delustro's wife attempted to physically restrain O'Neill during the altercation, uh, and she did this while O'Neill was just trying to get back into his vehicle. So while O'Neill was attempting to leave, um, Delustro uh, apparently picked up his handgun entered O'Neill's vehicle through the passenger side door. And O'Neill, not surprisingly, tried to drive away from this guy who's coming into his car. Uh, and, and when he did that, Delustro was only partially seated in the passenger seat, ultimately ended up firing a single shot that killed O'Neill. Now, in interviews with police, well, with SLED, uh, Delustro acknowledged that he knew O'Neill was attempting to leave the area and it was his intent to stop him. He also acknowledged that he never saw O'Neill with a weapon and that O'Neill never threatened to use one. So, although despite that, Delustro was still claiming self defense for why he shot him, uh, SLED agents say that he put himself in danger by entering O'Neill's vehicle with a handgun. Uh, especially since O'Neill was unarmed and was trying to walk away from an altercation and just leave. Through, like I said, these eyewitness accounts and video evidence, they ultimately determined uh, Delustro killed O'Neill with what they call malice afterthought, or a forethought, excuse me. So a very sad situation all around. An officer you would hope would not be so quick to pull out a weapon and shoot someone, although I'm sure some of you listening are like, what are you talking about? We, we, we've seen this before in other uh, altercations. Uh, now, this guy's off duty. He's getting in some kind of yelling match. Like, what is the point? You know, who knows what they're arguing over, but it's not worth this guy's life. So we'll, I'll certainly keep you updated on this sad situation where exactly, you know, how this will play out in court. Who knows? You know, it, what is the rule here when you're an off-duty officer telling someone they're under arrest and they try to flee? You know, I'm not saying shooting justifies it at all, but, you know, will a jury or, you know, think differently or will will they try to argue something about that? It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. But again, from eyewitness accounts and the video and from SLED's opinion, you know, the off-duty officer was the, the main aggressor and had no reason to shoot at O'Neill, um, but we'll certainly keep you updated. 
Alec Murdoch, we haven't talked about him in a while. The convicted murderer and disgraced former Low Country lawyers back in the headlines as he has filed an appeal over his federal sentence regarding his financial crimes. Uh, he has a couple um, sentences related to financial crimes, one on the state level. Uh, this specifically, the one he's trying to appeal is the financial crimes um, that were uh, charged federally. United States District Judge Richard M. Gurgle sentenced Murdoch to 40 years for those crimes on April 1st at the United States District Court here in Charleston. Uh, Murdoch was also ordered by Gurgle to pay $8.76 million in restitution. So the appeal was filed by Murdoch's lawyers, the same ones he had, you know, during um, both the federal, uh, I'm sorry, for both the federal um, and state financial crimes, as well as the uh, murder trial. Uh, their names are Jim Griffin and Dick Harputlian. So the 56-year-old Murdoch is already serving two life sentences for the murders of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. Uh, they were killed back on June 7, 2021. That's been uh, well documented, and it's I'm sure you all are very familiar with that whole story. Now, just last week, Murdoch had filed an appeal over the denial of his motion for a new uh, murder trial. So tried to get a new murder trial. That was denied. And then last week, Murdoch and his lawyers filed an appeal of that denial. So we've got a couple of appeals going on. One, appealing the decision not to grant him a new murder trial, and now an appeal for his federal sentencing. Um, as far as I've seen from local news coverage, because it just happened today as I was getting ready to record this podcast, although it was expected uh, over the last couple of days that he was going to appeal, it hasn't, we, we don't know why. Um, why they're filing this appeal. Like, what is their reasoning for it? What are they trying to say? So once I finally find what exactly the grounds for appeal, you know, they're citing here, I'll be sure to pass that along. Um, you know, just another twist and turn and what it's going to, I'm sure, be a years-long drama with Murdoch. And finally, another notorious name that we haven't talked about in a while. That's John C. Calhoun. Yes, the statue of him is back in the news. Um, so it, it, we still don't quite know what's going to happen with it. Uh, Charleston City Council took no action on April 9th, which was uh, you know their last meeting um, in regards to what to do with the statue. It's been nearly four years after the city council first voted to remove uh, this statue of the former vice president and slavery supporter from Marion Square. Um, this, you know, the the statue portion of that, you, you know, as you all remember, was on this huge pedestal. It's been uh, held, you know, somewhere by the city. There's been a couple uh, offers to museums that ultimately said they didn't want to bring the statue in. There was talks of it going to L.A. for some art exhibit that was and ended up being backtracked and didn't happen. Um, and, and so it's just been kind of sitting there. So the council went into executive session uh, to consult their attorney, which is allowed under state law. It's one of the few exceptions where uh, public bodies like this can close their meetings to the public. Uh, they wanted to discuss possible settlement terms in a lawsuit over what to do with that 12-foot statue. This lawsuit is the latest in a series uh, of different suits and other legal maneuvers that have been going on over these last four years, and it's been done by various groups uh, who are uh, really hoping to return the statue to public display for whatever reason they believe this person deserves to be honored. Um, we've discussed this ad nauseum in the past, so you all know my opinion on that. Uh, so because of this, they, you know, they're trying to consult on what to do, but ultimately after speaking with their lawyer, whatever they talked about, we don't know, of course, uh, they decided, um, to take no action in regards to this possible settlement. So at this time, it, the statue is still sitting somewhere, um, with no plans to come back out to the public. These lawsuits are still out there pending as, as no action was taken. Uh, so just like all the other stories, I'll be sure to keep you updated on where, if anywhere, the John C. Calhoun statue will end up. That will do it for this edition of Holy City Center Radio. I hope you are having a great week. Um, be sure to come back on Friday's episode. We have an interview scheduled, um, so that'll be a fun episode as you go into your weekend. Um, have a great next couple of days until you hear back from me. I, I did forget to mention my family's in town. My mom and dad are here visiting with their dog, so I'm excited to have them here. Um, I haven't. I was actually just back in Connecticut, as you may remember, not too long ago. Um, but it's nice to be able to see them again and hang out. I'm sure we'll do some fun things around town, go out to eat or what have you. So looking forward to that. Perhaps we'll uh, try some new places or places I haven't talked about in the podcast before. And I can update you on that.
But before I sign off, I do have to say thank you to Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this in every episode of Holy City Center Radio, and also Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every episode. Like I said, we'll be back on Friday with an interview, but until then, good night and good luck. <laughs>